Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I hope you can see me as a speaker view on the uh, on Teams because I'm going to be using my background to present. So, uh, gosh, what an extraordinary decade we have ahead of us. Um, I've been a professor for more than 30 years. I've been a teacher for many years before that. The next 10 years will eclipse all of that. We are seeing some of the most extraordinary um, changes around us and the world is full of surprises really we're um you know i don't think any of us were, were expecting a war in ukraine we weren't expecting the magnitude of climate catastrophe i wasn't expecting brexit it's crazy but it happened you know. so our lives are full of surprises and i think that changes enormously the way that education needs to proceed because we need to prepare children for these extraordinary surprises. And the only way to do that, of course, is to surprise them within their schools. Now, you know, we have, um, as, as you just heard, we have a huge variety of, of schools um, appearing around the world. And, and that variety, I think, is, um, is very good. We see um, some dramatic architecture, of course, uh, at a very large scale. We saw in here's um, look here's an example here. Uh, I'm building this school in Peru with um, Roseanne Bosch, you know, incredible place, uh, a great architectural dream. But at the same time, you know, we're seeing remarkable things. Here's um, here's a school I'm working, I've uh, been working with in Spain, and uh, this was a class of children where we said to the children we want you to design the classroom of the future and uh, we gave we gave them a budget of no money at all it's quite interesting and typically the less you spend in education on new environments the better um, if you spend too much you don't have to make choices you know if you if you reduce the budget you have to make choices and these children we actually have no money at all. You can see me standing here by a cardboard. They imagine they should have an interactive screen. And so they built a cardboard one, you know, to, and you can see here in the corner, there's a little three sided space. Which they built from brown paper and uh, and chicken wire. And you'll see that there's a curtain here so they can curtain off one part of the room from the other, but they didn't have enough, uh, pardon me, material. So the curtain is just there in the corners and you have to imagine the rest of it. Now, what's extraordinary about this is that any which way we measured it, the learning got better. Children arrived to lessons earlier, they stayed later, they were more engaged, their um, performance went up and yet this cardboard technology. They had a, they had a set of iPads and um, ten iPads. Only two were real, and eight were cardboard. You know, and they had numbers on, and you, you waited in turn to get the real one. Of course, what was happening was really interesting. They were role playing. Future learning. Children love to role play. My, I live with my granddaughters. They're forever role playing pirates and mermaids and goodness knows what. And they do it very well. And these children were role playing future learning. So they would stand beside the cardboard interactive screen and and articulate you know, what was on the screen and describe it. Of course, it wasn't there, but the others could imagine it from the good description. So what we know from a lot of work is that we have to do this with the agency of children. Their role is key. You know, we brought those children into um, the university, by the way, and gave them a warehouse and said, here's more cardboard, you know, <laughs> design a space you would like to come and work in as a, as a school student um, coming to university. And they designed this uh, this pretty impressive space in, in cardboard, which we then built. Uh, we copied their design exactly. And we used, these were stalls that had been thrown away, the, the top of one stool was good, but the legs were bad. The legs of another school were good, but the top was bad. So we put them together and children 
love this mashing up of resources to make for better learning. So very quickly we started to see that, you know, the variety of schools we were seeing around the world were eclipsed time and time again by small scale working with children on the details of their learning. This was a little school just down the road from where I live and the key thing we were doing here we really was to take all the variables of what makes good learning, which we're going to come to in a moment, and optimise them. So the light levels, the uh, the CO2, the ventilation, but also the room is zoned. So there's a, a zone for direct instruction. There's a zone for individualised learning. There's a zone for presentation. So even in a even in a tiny space, there are reasons to get up and to move around and to think about, um, I wonder what learning I'm doing now and to have a carousel of activities rather than just sitting in rows being taught. By the way, when COVID started, a lot of schools in England, and I don't really know why, started putting children back sitting in rows. I think they were trying to do the physical separation. Well, we're in the model of, we're in the middle of modelling the airflow in classrooms. You know what? What happens when the children all sit in rows facing the teacher is, of course, you get a you get a draft of breath from the children. The children are creating a river of um, virus bearing um, uh, aerosol droplets, which goes straight to the teacher. So it's very noticeable, I think, that when school started sitting children down in rows very quickly we had a very high level of of infection amongst teachers because the teachers were the most exposed by that so we're modeling a whole range of classrooms to see you know I wonder what the airflow is in different classrooms I wonder how it would be different and better and the key part of that of course is to ask the children to think about how they're arranging their furniture how they're changing their rooms around what are they making their classrooms um, like you know and here's um here's a simple example really I rather like this one of um children who were looking for more um activity so uh, they they thought they were too passive so you see here in the window there's now um a slide out of the window it's a we're on the third floor so when the children finish in their lesson they go and jump out of the window and um and hurtle from the building in a, in a really rather exciting way. <clears throat> of course, it gives them a place to um, to explore velocity and friction. I wonder what school uniform is fastest in the slope. And the teachers, um, look, here's the teachers. We, we were just hearing how important the teachers are in all this. Well, they are. But when they see better learning, they want to be part of it. So here are the teachers doing their professional development and basically they just jump out of the window and see what it's like for the children and in this case we gave them a glass of gin first because it made it more of a fun evening you know so suddenly we're looking for a huge amount of variety in the spaces where we're building in our schools and the um and the places this one is in um i've just opened this school in Riyadh in uh, saudi arabia and i think you can see it doesn't look like any traditional Saudi Arabian schools, but the building was there already. We just took an existing building, changed the furniture, changed the layout, changed the pedagogy, as you can see. And that's the thing that changes everything really more than more than the building. And it's worth reflecting, by the way, that you don't even need a building. I mean, by the way, here's the um, here's the room I'm sitting in now. This is I'm sitting in this window. Look, even I've got a slide in my building because it's a great way of getting your head to wake up, you know. So let's start thinking then about the the details of making learning better. And we've neglected them um, really rather badly, I think. I think children have been um, presented with um, really rather um, disappointing models of um, of learning. Um, they don't know they're disappointing, except that they find themselves losing attention. They find themselves falling asleep. They find themselves 
producing work that disappoints them. And it turns out that every detail matters. Look, I've just been, obviously, we're just approaching the exam season now, so I've just been measuring um, examination rooms. And this, you can see this examination room, the real, the real room. This is their real data. You see one side of the room is lighter than the other, but neither side of the room is light enough to optimise your cognitive processes. You're looking for about 500 lux to do that. And um, you'll see that the temperature is too high. Ideally, you want to be at about um, 18 to 21 degrees for learning. Every degree above 21 degrees, your learning performance goes down. And it's a straight line. You don't have to wait till it's 25 or 26, 22 and 23. At 23 degrees, if you're doing a maths test, you're probably going to be about 1.8 to 2% worse in your mark than you would have been at 21 degrees. These numbers really impact on children. And the um, CO2, catastrophically high in the exam room because all the children were breathing and the CO2 had gone way too high. I mean, the CO2 in the room I'm sitting in right at the moment, I have a little box. Hang on, I have a little box here that lets me Let's me measure the um, let's me measure the CO2 in the room that I'm in. The CO2 in here is only 485 parts per million. So how do you make the CO2 better in your room? You know, you've measured it. The CO2 is too high. It really profoundly impacts on your ability to learn. Well, you can see here, I think, um, how easy it is. These four graphs are a classroom, you are trying to keep CO2 below this number. So you're trying to keep it in the blue threshold. The beginning of the school day is here. This is about an hour of school. You can see this class, just a regular class of children in a normal classroom. Very quickly, I mean, within less than half an hour, the CO2 has gone too high and they're already suboptimal. They're learning less well. They're feeling disappointed in themselves. And that class has no windows or doors open. In this, these two classes, they've opened the windows, but not the doors. And you can see very quickly the CO2 is climbing up. It's not quite at a crisis yet, but before they get to break, it will be. Because, of course, the windows are not on the floor. So the CO2 from the top half of the room goes out, but the bottom half of the room fills up with CO2, a bit like a swimming pool, you know. And this one last um, line at the bottom here, you can see just stays nice and level, is one where the children have opened all the doors and they've opened all the windows. Now, you know, children love being given this data so that they can respond to it and they can take action. And there are lots of other actions they can take to improve CO2 as well. We know that um, photosynthesis, for example, is a is a good friend for schools. So if you have plants, I have my plant here. Whoops, a daisy. I have my plant here. Uh, here's um, Mavis the money plant, you know, and she's doing a very good job of oh, taking my CO2 and giving me back oxygen. We, we know that um, you need about one plant per child, so it becomes really interesting to um, give each child their own plant and get them to name their plants. And so yes, that's my um, that's my Mavis or that's my whatever, you know, they experiment with them. There's a lot of science in trying different nutrients and different levels of light. And maybe if you're into STEM building a little Arduino box to clip on the side of the flower pot and do self watering. I mean, there's a lot of curriculum work in a plant, but crucially, the plants do a wonderful job of just getting the CO2 out of the school, out of the classroom, get the kids' brains buzzing and alert. You know, movement really matters as well. Here's um, this is somewhere. This is not my work. This is um, American University, and they've these are functional MRI scans of uh, their aggregate scans of 20, 20 students. Twenty students. They're doing a maths test. You can see that here they've done. 
Well, to be honest, I used to ask children to do all those years ago when I was a classroom teacher, which is before the test, sit down, relax, have a calm moment, collect your thoughts, focus, then start the test. The other group here were told to keep active, keep moving until the test starts. Walk around the class, talk to other people, keep your brain working and then start. You can see from the colour the level of brain activity in these two groups of children. You can see that moving around, standing, has a, it's much better for your brain than sitting down or being sedentary, you know, and um, we see that time and time and time and time again. I think possibly um, Le Corbusier, the architect, knew that, and uh, this is one of his um, drawings, you know, showing his sadness at children coming in from learning outside and moving around and being part of nature and ending up sitting at a desk staring at the front. I mean, he was making a political point here about fascism and, you know, you could maybe graph that onto that model of learning too. But the key point was that when you get outside, you know, my goodness, the learning can get a lot better. And just down the road from where I am, this is um, busy happening. This is uh, a beach school where children, preschool children initially, do learning on the beach. They look at the flora and fauna. They look at the um, the seaweeds. They look at the sand. They look for little microscopic particles of plastic in the sand. They understand about pollution. They understand about invasive species. They're working now with major marine research centres in Britain because the children who are on the beach every week know so much more about the um, if you go, go there, go to beachschool.org, go and have a look. The children know so much more about the um, physical environment that they're, that they're living in. That's hugely exciting. And by the way, we're trying to open a beach school on the banks of the, um, the Amazon, we hope, for indigenous kids who live in the rainforest. You know, you don't need bricks and mortar to build excellent learning. And of course, <clears throat> when we start looking at the data, in detail, we realise that things like noise really matter. Here's a group of children in Islington and um, they've looked at noise and they understand that if you get above about something like um, 70 decibels, it becomes quite hard to, um, to concentrate. So they have a little um, decibel meter in the class and these two children are in charge of noise. If the class gets noisy, they will come and it's not a teacher's job. The children need the agency, the permission, the license to make their learning as good as it can be. And if I go back to that um, very depressing image from um, from an examination room, you know, when we look at it, you realise that everything was wrong in the room. The noise was the only thing that was appropriate because obviously in the exam room, if it was being quiet, but even in the quiet of the exam room, the noise of the fan, the the beats per minute of the fan uh, is way too high and it's very, very distracting. Now, it's hard to put a number on the impact on the exam of all those things being wrong, but I'm prepared to bet it's a number bigger than 10% on every child in the room. So this is fascinating stuff and um, it starts to lead us to a very interesting place. So let's think about where we currently are then for a moment, because we don't have a lot of time for talking today. How's the time going? Oh, not bad. We've got a little bit left. So computers are key to all this because there are things that computers do really well that we used to do in schools. Computers are very good at rule-based systems. They follow rules. Programming is all about rules. Algorithms are about rules. They are very good at remembering. They're very good at matching. So take that and that, put them together. Here's one, let's do another one like it. They're very good at doing what they're told. It's how we program them again. They're incredibly consistent and they spend a lot of time on repetition. Now, we used to build schools 
the children to do what they were told, to be good at repetition, to follow rule-based systems, and to do all the things that today's computers do very well. So a very interesting question then is, well, what on earth should people do? Well, we should do the things we're good at. We should, we should be focusing on ingenuity. It's more than creativity. You know, if I put my water bottle on my head, I guess that's creative. But to invent a water bottle that's that I can fold and go in my pocket, that's ingenuity. Um, we're very good at problem solving. We're very good at deep, deep, deep knowledge. We're very good at collaborating. We're very good at playfulness and adventure. So we need to build schools that are places for ingenuity, places for playfulness, places for collaboration, places where we can be all the things that computers will never be good at. And it turns out, of course, that those places are cheap and easy to build. You know, and we need to think a little bit. Look, here's, here's um, Mark Oliphant College in um, in Australia, where they have no room numbers. Every room is a puzzle. So room nine is the square root of 81. They have, um, you know, we have protractors in the doorway. We have, we have cl clocks that when you look at the clock, you know, every number is a puzzle. We have rooms that, you know, every surface is writable. This is my um, learning lab in Madrid. You know, every surface is writable. You can see everywhere the light levels are, are colossal. Um, you you mix up ages, you know, here is a young child working with an older child. This child knows how to do woodwork. This child is just learning. He's guiding the saw, the little one's doing the sawing. But look in the background, the teacher is helping the child and she's got her arms around the child and she's doing the sawing herself. So here's a child learning how to saw with an older child helping. Here's a child watching how to saw with a teacher doing it for don't need me to spell out the difference between these you know these schools with children bringing in their plants checking the atmosphere children and working with their teachers showing them how it works this is a lovely example from spain where the little tiny primary children here are showing the university professors and students how to use the skype bars that we built as we used to call them back in the days of skype so, you know, if you're teaching at this table, eight people at a table and a screen, the teacher sits here and faces the screen. So your voice will go not into the whole room, but just into the screen. And the primary school children are saying, this is how you use the space because they've helped design the space. They have agency, they have skin in the game. So um, lots more of this I see in the chat space, people are looking at my website. It's it's there. 24, I know, 27, I think now, million people on that website. 27 million people on that website in the last year. And please follow me on Twitter because these discussions are happening, happening absolutely everywhere as people look to do it in a new way. But let me close with the big danger. Because there is a big danger. You remember that just the other day we heard that Steve Jobs, um, wonderful little iPod. Here I still have my original one with the wheel and the screen. They've stopped making, you know, they made smaller iPods, like this little kind of USB one. Now they make no iPods at all. Now the iPod did what it did very well. It played music, it managed MP3 files. But along came another device, which I think this case is the phone, you know, and the phone did a lot of things. One of the things it did was manage MP3 files, but it did other things besides. If all our schools do is deliver learning, they will be replaced. Children do have choices. We saw during the pandemic that children, many children, but not all, thrived on the opportunity to learn differently, to learn out of doors, to follow depth rather than breadth, to learn with others, to learn with their grandfathers and and, uh, and others. And they like that very much. And uh, when we surveyed a huge number of children in mid-COVID, 
and we said, um, how many days a week do you think you need to come to school to still be part of the social community and have your best friends and be, you know, in the football club? Their average reply was two. The average reply was two. Not one child said five days. So we know that kids are already taking their choices. We know that very large numbers of kids in England have not gone back to school at all. So we don't want our schools to be the iPod doing one thing very well, but not all the other things. We need to think afresh. And for me, that means looking at who else is in our learning club, you know, who else wants to do learning with us, you know, who else is is interested in transforming learning. And of course, those other people turn out to be the health system, companies, families. We've, my last thing and then I'll stop, we've experimented in Spain with inviting all our parents to, to do courses. We've said to them, here are eight and a half thousand courses. Pick any course you like, study it, and we will pay. And it's been amazing. Parents queuing up. We have a waiting list now for parents to do courses. It turns out families are learning organizations. Companies are communities of purpose. And the purpose is how can we learn better? Health is a place of learning. If we're going to improve our health, we have to learn how to do it. So suddenly everybody is in the game that's learning. If schools are going to survive, we can have to do learning with the others. It ain't expensive. We can do it in all those empty buildings where people used to be doing offices or retail. The world's full of buildings. So let's start sharing them with some of those other learning folk and really see what tomorrow's learning looks like. I'll tell you what, it doesn't look like the iPod, probably doesn't even look like the phone because phones days are numbered. It looks like people learning together everywhere and doing it with ingenuity and doing it with delight and doing it with all ages and doing it 24 7 and for me that's going to be the best decade we've ever seen as we transition and knock down probably half the schools we've got and move into this new world of learning it could well be the death of education but i'll tell you what it feels to me like the dawn of learning Nothing could be more exciting. Thank you very much. I'll see you on Twitter. <laughs> Goodbye now. Goodbye.